What I'm going to give is uh, just an overview of the Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department, and then I'll give an overview of ACI, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about how do, we, um, how do you come back here? How do you come uh, get this as an assignment? So um, first of all, um, a change that happened last year is kind of probably transparent to the cadets here and most people, but uh, uh, ACI used to be a direct report to the soup, but now we fall under EECS. So that's why I'm kind of talking on behalf of both. Um, I happen to have experience because I did teach in EECS before, and I was the EECS faculty recruiter. I actually recruited Colonel Arnold, I think, um, a long time ago to, for his first tour in, in EECS. Um, back in the day, so I've, I've been around this process for, for a little while. All right, so um, I'll give you an overview of EECS, as I said, over ACI, and then how you become a part of our team. Um, all right, so the EECS mission is uh, to educate and train the Corps of Cadets uh, to inspire uh, leaders of character and lifelong learners who think critically, innovate, apply computing and engineering expertise as officers. So um, as the talks have all talked about today, you know, getting to your unit, being innovative, using the new equipment, as we talked about EW equipment, all of those things, finding things that are wrong, fixing them, and, and making the Army better. Um, we, we hope to, to do that in, in, uh, in EECS. And, and obviously, we have people that graduate from EECS department, electrical engineering, computer science, cyber science are the three majors, and go into other branches, which is great because they can spread the good word about uh, those technologies. Um, so what does it actually mean, though? Um, if you apply to come back here you, as a rotating, uh, junior rotating faculty, you will be uh, teaching uh, the, the West Point Cadets know CY 105. Um, that'll be like the first thing you do. You actually, you'll go to a summer program called FDW, Faculty Development Workshop, which we, you, you're, you're taught how to teach. So um, kind of a train the trainer thing, um, kind of how the classrooms are set up, what, what, what are your expectations, how you use academy management system, the, the, the the opposite version of CIS that the faculty use. Um, so you'll learn those kinds of things. And then um, uh, after that summer, you'll teach uh, the, the core class that every cadet teach, uh, takes, which is uh, CY 105. Now, um, before I go any further, I do want to make something really clear. I think that there's a myth that I've heard in my 24 years in the Army that every once in a while, every couple years, I'll hear this thing of, oh, do you have to be a West Pointer to go teach at West Point? It's, it's not true at all. Like, go back to your ROTC units and tell them, if you aspire to teach at West Point, ROTC can come and teach at West Point. OCS can come and teach at West Point. In fact, we look to have a little bit of diversity of instructors. So a sergeant major in the Army can come and teach at West Point, Sergeant Major Drager. She teaches one of our 400-level uh, uh, cyber courses. So um, we've actually had a staff sergeant from the band uh, teach in, in the computer science department because he had a, um, as long as you have a master's in computer science or related discipline, then, then that's an option. So um, we definitely bring that back. Uh, warrant officers, have we had a warrant officer teach? Ooh, we got to get on that. Okay. I, I, we may have, and I just don't know about it. I don't know. I, I, I can't think of one in my head, but I, I, I'll get chief to teach a class next semester and then we can check that block. So, um, so yeah, we've, we, we, uh, you, you can be, like I said, you can come from a different commissioning source and come here. So please spread that word out there. The myth, it d never existed. It's never existed that, that we only have West Pointers come back to teach West Point. That would be kind of strange. So uh, just remember that. All right. So uh, how the department's organized, uh, just briefly. Um, as I said, we, we, Army Cyber Institute now falls under um, the EECS department. So my boss is now Colonel uh, Raftery, uh, the department head of EECS. There's the deputy department head. There is a thing my, my cadets were asking about and some of the cadets here may, may wonder. Um, uh, the, there's, there's kind of like, just so you understand the senior officer uh, positions at West Point, there's actually um, some interesting things that happen. So I'm a cyber officer, but my uh, functional area is 47 Victor, which means I'm a Army Cyber Institute Academy professor. It's very specific. There's f five of us in the Army right now. Um, so, uh, once, uh, once you apply to become an academy professor, that means these are professors who will stay here until they retire. This is the last job I'll have in the Army. Uh, maybe not last, well, this is my last job, but it doesn't have to be the last job, but, but this is your last post. You're not going to leave West Point. Um, so that's, a, that's an option. Um, when you get to the next level of that is, is, is these two people, so Colonel Chuar and Colonel Raftery. Um, they're even a little more special because they actually changed their basic branch to PUSMA, which is a... Um, a professor, United States Military Academy, 
which means that um, when you're the deputy, you, you, once, the re, once the head retires, you become the head. When, when you retire as the head of a department, you actually pin on one star, so you retire as a brigadier general, and then, um, but you're only one star for a day. So because of that, you don't get the retirement pay of a, of a brigadier general, you just get the honors of being a retired general. So that being said, Colonel Raftery is also an ROTC graduate. So um, an ROTC graduate will, when he retires next summer, he will, he will uh, retire at West Point as, a, as Brigadier General Raftery. Okay. Um, so, uh, oh, I'll go back. I think uh, I just wanted to basically show how we have, um, in our teaching program, we have the core, which this is our, um, all the classes that we teach that are mandatory for all the cadets, so CY-105, CY-305, and um, I think there's the core classes fall under that. Um, there's the computer science, which is the computer science major, so, so Colonel Harrison. He's the other half of Colonel Arnold who created the cyber branch insignia, so they were the ones drawing that out um, years ago that we're, you'll, you'll all wear later. Um, we've just stood this major up, the cyber science. We have a cyber science program we sunsetted our IT program and then created the, the cyber science program. So you can get a cyber science degree. Uh, ABET accreditation um, of that degree is forthcoming and it's not here yet, but it, it will be an ABET accredited degree um, once we graduate enough in that major. Um, and then finally, electrical engineering and Colonel Blaine is there. We also have these research centers. These may possibly change, they, they evolve over time, but we have a cyber research center focused on cyber research for cadets. We have a photonics research center and, and a robotics research center as well. Now, um, what that means is, in, and I'll get into this when I get to ACI, but as an instructor, I said you'll teach 105. The first year, you'll probably just teach um, CY 105, learn how to teach and get good at it. Then you could possibly branch into whatever um, your, your specialty is or teach a class that's interesting to you um, within, within your field. Um, but there's also some side things you'll do, like um, I'm in charge of the ham radio club. I'm assistant OIC of the uh, chemical engineering club as well. So um, there's also the, the cadet sports teams, the club teams, and then the actual teams like or the, the NCAA teams and the uh, core squad teams. Uh, you could be an officer representative for that. So there's a lot of other things that you can do outside of the classroom to support the core. Um, so that, those are things that you could do as an instructor. Um, you also, there's, there's, uh, there's five pillars. I won't get into the, the, the details of that right now, but there's, um, uh, there are opportunities in these centers. Those are these opportunities for you to, um, this is, no, there it is, um, here to do, uh, research in, in your field as well. Now you will be teaching a full load, so you'll, you won't get to do a lot of research unless you do it on your own time, but um, you can do some research while you're here. All right, so, whoa, now I went, yeah, there we go. So what does it look like right now? About 120 plus staff and faculty. We have an NSA fellow, um, kind of an interesting note. Um, oh, I can't think of his name right now. The, the old direct, uh, deputy director of NSA, um, Chris Inglis, uh, he, back in the late, early 90s, was actually in EECS department as one of the NSA fellows. So I always tell the NSA fellows, like, you got big shoes to fill. You have to be deputy director of NSA someday. Or he's the cyber czar for the, uh, uh, now for, for the president. So um, pretty interesting. Uh, we have one Lincoln Labs fellow right now. This, this, this can continue, can change. As I said, there's uh, uh, the four teaching programs, core, computer science, cyber science, electrical engineering our three research centers, and then uh, now RB Cyber Institute falls under, and I'll get in uh, to the four areas we work in next. All right, so Army Cyber Institute, where I work right now. Um, you saw a lot of the low level, the platoon litter, the brigade division. If you go all the way up on the other end of the scale, you get to the highest level of, of how cyber is laid out right now. So um, if we look at it, we have, um, the headquarters, DAG6, so this is the, the kind of the more the signal side of the house, resource and policy. Headquarters, DAG357, uh, uh, man, uh, DA management offices, so it's DEMO uh, SO. It used to be DEMO CY Cyber, now it's DEMO Strategic Operations, but there's, a, there's also a DEMO SOC, which is Strategic Operations uh, Specific Cyber. 
So, um, and that's, that's where the, the plans and policies come, up, come about. Um, <clears throat> what is, I just realized what's not listed, okay. Um, uh, the, there's also one other, this is in the Pentagon, both of these are in the Pentagon. There's also one other piece here, it's, it's not Army Command, but it's the civilian side, it's rather new. Uh, you might hear called the Principal Cyber Advisor for the Army. So, Dr. Sula Meyer, who Sergeant Major and I just met with uh, last week uh, down at the Pentagon, uh, he, he does more of the civilian advisement side of that. And, and, uh, and so that's another piece that, that in ACI we, we uh, focus on that as well because we basically have to answer to like four different people. So uh, Army Cyber Command, uh, as we talked about, so this is General Barrett. And then uh, Cyber Center of Excellence, you've got a full dose of that with, with uh, General Vile and General Stanton. So General Stanton is this two-star right here. And then we have uh, where I'm at over here, Army Cyber Institute. So we are providing kind of general support of cyber across the Army but with research um, and forward-looking things. The way I like to think of it, and, and I think uh, J.C. Fernandez here, uh, Major Fernandez and I have talked about this a lot of like, when you're in the fight, you sometimes see problems and you're like, ah, I know how to fix that, but I don't have six months to go do that. And, and th that is what I kind of, I see as the, as the junior rotating people coming into ACI, is you've seen some problems in the fight, but you don't have time to really solve them. But at ACI, we're not operational, we're not in the fight, we're not doing cyber operations. We're stepping back one and saying, okay, what is, what is the six month, what's the two year, what, what are, where are we gonna be in cyber? What are things that we could fix to make it better for the cyber operators today? Um, and, and that spans across the education all the way to, to operations. So, uh, so yeah, let's uh, go to the next one. So here's our vision, a premier institute that expands our knowledge of cyber competition to prevent strategic surprise. I, I am actually going to be doing an offsite, and we're going to be potentially shifting this a little bit. Um, but really, what, like I said, we're going to be focusing on um, longer-term problems a, across the Army in, in all, all aspects of cyber. Okay. Uh, how we're broken down, as I showed the, the different pieces of EECS, right now, in, in this, I, I feel like cyber is such a dynamic environment. I'm showing you this as today. Um, if this summer we could possibly change this. It's, it's definitely always up for debate. I, we try not to change too much, but we have to adapt to the Army. We have to adapt to the needs that we see. So right now, the way we kind of uh, have our expertise aligned and the way we're seeing cyber in the Army is we have the information warfare side, and that's the side that is in uh, direct alignment support with the information advantage and all of, all of that aspect of cyber. Um, it, you know, we oftentimes, I oftentimes as a computer scientist, you know, think about, okay, disabling the machine, getting remote access, setting an implant, like those kinds of tactical operations. Well, what does that all mean if the other person isn't using that computer? Like there's the, there's the human aspect side of things. And I think we're seeing, we see a ton of that with the Ukraine and Russia right now. There's just a ton of misinformation, disinformation, and, and these influence operations. You can hack people without having to get, uh, without having to, to send a spam email and implanting a computer. You could just implant their mind, right? So thinking of things in that terms, it's this other side of cyber um, that, that is, I, I, all of you have seen it, I'm sure. You've all had different aspects and things. And I mean, now it's not like 10 years ago when you would Google something, you just get a search result. You're getting a curated Google list of based off of your search history and all of those things. So. Uh, in, in a sense, you're kind of being programmed by, by all these algorithms. And th that's the research areas that, that the, our information warfare looks at. Our core team, you've probably had time to talk to here today. They're the ones who ran this event, so thank you again, core team. Uh, Cyber Operations Research and Engineering. <clears throat> and uh, they've done uh, more of the hands-on piece, more of the physical systems piece, looking at uh, creating threat emitters. There's a we have our we have uh, Chief Price here, uh, Captain Schmel doing um, full force on looking at the future of EW systems. As we as we have been told here, we don't have programs of, of record that are out there yet. TLS is on on the horizon, terrestrial layer system, um, but it's not out yet. And there's still debate as to what that even looks like. I think Lockheed just won the contract. Um, but in the meantime, there's there's uh, if so, anybody here play with an RTLSDR. Okay, a few people, one person. 
That's our ham radio operator over there, right? Yeah. <laughs> so get your ham license. I'm, gonna, I'm the ham radio operator, so I can, I can make my own pitch on this one. Um, if you're interested in EW, if you want to learn more about it, you could be a fake electrical engineer like I am. I'm a computer scientist, but I, I play electrical engineer when I, when, I, when I get in the ham radio club room. Um, it is a great hobby. There's direction finding. There's literally all of the interesting aspects and kind of the technical aspects of EW um, is, is in the ham radio uh, uh, realm. Uh, you can, uh, you know, I, I think I've kind, of, I've kind of seen it evolve over time, but without the internet and without cell phones, ham radio was like how we talk to people long distance without using, you know, long distance uh, corded phone companies. And um, in fact, I was just talking uh, this morning with, uh, with uh, Mr. Monaco here, which was, uh, he used the Mars station when he was a cadet to talk back, um, uh, to talk back home because that was one way of doing uh, long distance. And that was, that was common back then, um, which is a completely mind bending thing when you think you're transmitting a signal, it's bouncing off the ionosphere and then reaching a, a, a far distance. So if you're interested in that, then definitely wanna uh, get your ham license as Chief just got his, so congratulations to Chief Price. Uh, all right, and, um, and then clone code detection, is they're doing a, um, really interestingly, and I just saw the purchase order, so we're about to buy a whole bunch of uh, internet routers, the, the common routers that, that, uh, that households will buy, and uh, we're gonna be pulling all the firmware off of them and doing some analysis, so if you're interested in that kind of stuff, that's, what, that's the kind of things this team, uh, this team does. All right, uh, we have a law and policy team, uh, and so that goes back to, and I know, so Liam's here, he was on the, uh, uh, the cyber policy team, which was a phenomenal, I got a chance to go out with them to some great places and listen to him uh, uh, really think through at the strategic side how, how you can respond to events in, uh, in cyber with policy. And it's a, it's a critical piece that we have to figure out because we can have all the technology in the world, but if we have no policy to figure out how to employ it, then we're hosed. Um, so I, it was super, super eye-opening when I got a chance to listen to his team come up with some really excellent responses to, to crises. I think the, wait, what, were you at the, you're at Australia and France, I think, are the two places we went. It was uh, fantastic, um, but really, really eye-opening. I think the eye-opening thing for Australia was they're kind of hosed. Right, so actually since then they've rewritten their cyber policy, like their, their structure, but the, the funny thing is that I, I'll never forget about that was after the, our team went, the, the, the judges were like, the Australian judges were like, wow, I wish you could pitch this to some of our government administrators because they don't understand how host we are. Like it was really, really eye-opening. Um, so law and policy, we currently have a, um, one of our academy professors is a, a JAG lawyer who, who looks at the law and policy side, and we actually run a program in ACI to educate lawyers who are going to be going to cyber units. So if you think about that, a lawyer's trained as a, as a lawyer to be a lawyer. When they come to a cyber unit, how do they handle that? I and mean, that's a whole other aspect of, of things we have to figure out. So uh, we, we, we run this cyber operations technical foundations course for those, uh, for those JAG uh, attorneys who are going to be going and having to deal with uh, uh, deal, deal with law at that at like cybercom and our cyber. So hopefully the one the lawyers you deal with will have gone through that course or at least have some background in that. And then lastly, we have our data and decision science team. So um, as uh, as we've seen, the the secretary of the army's second priority is to make the army data centric. What does that mean? I, I mean it it sounds awesome, but implementing that and figuring what, out what that means is really, really challenging. Uh, so this team actually has some, uh, a lot of hands-on. We're doing, we have like, I don't know what kind of GPUs. I don't have the, that anybody from that team here, I don't think. Um, but they got these Lambda servers. They got multiple servers. They got a whole lab set up, training models, um, doing that uh, machine learning, that chat GPT type stuff. Like that's the kind of things that they're, that they're working on and, and working on it with like network data and understanding can you, can you just, find that needle in the haystack of attacks that are happening on a network just by looking at that data. So that's what that team does. All right, so, uh, so as you, um, I, I gave you two completely different sides of, of, of how you could come here. If you're really interested in teaching cadets and, 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 and you, you enjoy that, 
then X is where you would want to apply to. If you're interested in doing one of those four areas or any area within cyber research, then, then ACI is where you'd want to go. Um, you can teach from ACI. As an academy professor, I actually teach a cloud computing course. I got oh, Ben here, he took my class. He gave me a thumbs up, maybe I did good, I don't know. Um, so uh, we, uh, uh, we, do, I, we do do some teaching. Some of our rotators do teach, but in general, the majority of their time is spent researching. Uh, if you, uh, um, so uh, what I'll say now is the, the great part is the application process for both are pretty much in the same, they're in the same portal, so you can apply to both. As I said, you could be ROTC. I, I, would, I would just say, start thinking about this now, and the reason why I say that is um, in, I, th I wanna say, gosh, 2004, I was in Iraq. I, I came back and I was burnt out of the army. I was burnt out of, of being deployed for a year. And I was like, you know, I, I think I'm good. I, I, I think I did my, my time and, and I, was getting, I was getting out. And, and I got this email from, um, from actually Colonel Estes, for those who, who knew her when she was here, she just retired. Uh, she, she was a captain and she said, you know, apply to teaching deeks. And I'm like, there's no way they would take me. Not a chance. So any of you who thinks there's not a chance, there's still a chance. Uh, I was just like, I was kind of middle of the road. I just graduated. I was happy. I'm happy with my, my computer science degree and I'm ready to get out of the army. So I did apply anyways. I was just like, well, it's kind of a crap shoot. So I come back from Iraq and a few months later, I get a call from her saying, congratulations, you've been accepted to come back and teach at West Point. And um, I didn't even know what all of this meant. Like I was talking to my wife, I was like, what, what happened? Like I'm planning on getting out. Uh, so uh, here I am, 25 years, <laughs> 20, yeah, I'll be 25 years this summer, uh, still in the Army. So my five-year plan turned out to be a little bit longer. So uh, I, I think what it, what it did for me professionally and personally is my, I had young children at the time, um, but what you get to do when we select you is we um, do a by-name request to HRC to say, send this person to grad school. So... Uh, once that goes through, you go to grad school. The cool thing is you are paid as a captain. Captains pay to go, and they pay for the school to go to school. So that's your full-time job. So you get a chance to really break away from the Army and say, okay, take a, take a knee. It's not taking a knee in academics because that first semester was, oof. Going back to school after not being in school is a, is a gear shift that you have to a context switch or whatever you want to call it, but it is it can be rough. Um, but once you get in the groove of things, you, you, you can make it through. Um, but uh, after that, I came here and taught, and it was just an amazing experience. It was just really, really fun to work with cadets, figure out, you know, figure out how, how cadets learn, how, how people think about things, how to communicate. I got much better at briefing. All of these things, like, happened, and I was just like, this was just great. And uh, so then I was planning on... Uh, I was actually planning on, uh, I didn't know what to do after that. I, I had no idea. I ended up going to Cybercom because uh, General Alexander wanted all, of, all the computer scientists to go to Cybercom. So that's what happened. And then I applied to come back because I loved it so much. So um, I'm, I'm just a huge fan of this process. I'm a huge fan of kind of where it hits you in your career because you can get burned out. You know, after four years in the Army, charging hard, working many hours, taking a little bit of a break and being able to set your own schedule and, and going to grad school is, it, it may be the break you need. And I've talked to, as I was a recruiter, I talked to many people off the ledge, like saying, hey, um, you know, I know you're frustrated right now. You're probably frustrated with your chain of command, whatever it may be. But once you go to grad school, it'll be a reset and then you, then you can go back out to the force refreshed. So I think that that process does that really well. Uh, so what you'll do mechanically here is you'll go to uh, teach at Westmont EDU you can actually start this now. So if you're even halfway interested, you can start it now. And what that does is it just helps us look forward of saying, okay, we've got some packets in the pipeline. We probably won't contact you until the time comes of when it, when it makes sense. Uh, so the timing is really, really critical. Um, I don't know if we, we, you probably talked in some of your small groups about this concept of a key and developmental position. If, you, if everybody knows this and I don't have to talk about it, do, does, does, do we know what key and developmental means? Okay, I'm seeing a lot of head nods. So but in short, 
these are the jobs you have to have to be promoted to the next rank. You have to be able to do, you have to do a, a job. It used to always be for captain, it was easy. It was just company command. In cyber, it's a little different, probably team leads, and, and there's probably variants that you can get through. But you'll know if you're going to a KD position. So the thing is, if you think about the timeline of when you go from uh, grad school to West Point and then back out to the force, that's five years, because it's like two, about two-ish years in grad school and then three years at teaching at West Point. Those are five years you can't do a key and developmental position, um, especially, I don't, think, I, I don't think any of the slots in EECS, definitely the ones in ACI are not KD. So you need to get that KD job before you can apply. So it puts you in a tight time frame of really there's optimal years. And I, I think I did the calculations. It should be for this group, if you graduate this summer, 2027, 2028 is going to be the time frame you're going, that are going to be like your optimal years. 2029 is going to be kind of the edge. So really 28 is, your, is, is, the, is, is the key time uh, to do that application in the, that year. The board will meet um, the following, uh, it'll probably meet December, it'll probably meet January, the following, the beginning of the following year. Announcements go out a few months after that. And then you don't start grad school until the following year after that. So we have to do some really kind of long-term yearly planning to make this work. Um, because once that goes in, this binary request process happens, we go back and forth with the branch, making sure that your, your, your career's on track. And then, we, and then we put you in grad school the following year. So it, it is a long-term process. I know that it's hard to think about this now when you're just trying to graduate. But um, later on, just try to remember back that, this, that it takes that time. Um, what do we look at when we, when we have people apply? Uh, the GRE is one, I, I, I have a love-hate relationship with that thing. The problem is when I'm sitting on a board, I look at it. When I think of it as myself, the first time I took it, I kind of blew, blew it up. Like, it did not go so well. But I, I, I've taken it probably two or three times now. And it is not something you take cold, is all I can tell you. There's great books out there to get you just to understand the test so that you can take it correctly. Um, it is a hard test. It is, it, it's no joke. Um, but I, many, many people come in and they do it really well. The, the ones that we always have issues with, you see a perfect file and like this, is, this person's great, and their GREs are pretty weak. Usually it's because, oh yeah, I took it right after I came out of the field. That's not a good time to do it. Um, don't, don't do that. Uh, it, plan it out early enough. Just take it, take it once, get a feel for it, and then, and then a year later maybe take it again. Uh, and and that's just a, that, that'll just give you an advantage on the board if, you, if you're really, really uh, want to make sure you get, you get back in this. Um, and then um, that's, the last thing I'll say is there's this direct hire possibility. So I've talked with uh, many people here that are doing grad school. I think Liam, he said he's starting grad school. So you, you, you do grad school. Um, we don't generally hire, like plan for direct hires, but the way it works is that... Uh, we put in all our people in our pipeline, and then for various reasons, family reasons, um, change of thought of wanting to do this reasons, whatever it is, we have people that kind of drop off at times, and that's where we fill our direct hires from. So they're kind of a one-off, but we generally have one or two available. So if you have the degree and your timeline starts to work out and you think you could like start the following summer or even before that, if you think it's something you may want to be programmed in, we can also program in years out, we can program in a direct hire if it, if it makes sense. So those are other options. The, the last thing I'll say, there is a one more thing. If you already have your master's and you did it on your own or through a scholarship and you want to do a PhD, that's a three year process, we can potentially support that as well. It, again, the timelines are really critical. Um, to start on time and, and, and keep your, your, keep your uh, career on track. So uh, HRC basically will not want to put you in a bad position and put you in school, and then all of a sudden you come up on a board and they look at it and they say, you haven't done the right stuff to get promoted. Like, you don't want to be in that position. And, and we'll try to screen that. HRC, everybody tries to look at that to make that happen. But um, if I can leave you with anything, the timeline timeline's critical. Applying early is a, is a good thing to do to, to, to at least get on the radar. Um, and if you're not interested in EECS or ACI, all the other departments are always looking for people too. So if you want to teach in uh, SOCH or in um, the law department, or if you wanted to get a degree in one of those fields, you want to branch out, we need that, that diversity in cyber. We have all, you know, almost, we have like six different departments, I think, uh, uh, represented within ACI alone. So it's the same application, teach.westmine.edu, and, and you can go from there. So 
That's all I have. Are there any questions?